Merry Christmas and happy holidays, gals and guys. In this edition of My Media Helpers Entertainment Online, we'll take a peek at merry and bright films that are streaming through the jolly bandwidth near you. Each day this week, I'll jump on a different streaming service to give you my best picks as to what flicks to check out this 2021 holiday season. There are so ho 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 many movies on these streaming services, it's hard to determine what's worth watching. I want to recommend some of my personal favorites. Films I present to you aren't necessarily award winners by any stretch of the imagination. These are solid films, and they're certainly worth a watch during the festive season. Now, you would have thought this was easy. It was ten times harder than the Halloween films I covered. There were a lot of films to choose from on each service, and I watched a hell of a lot of Christmas movies before doing this video, but most were simply Kris Kringle awful. But for today's picks, we're going to explore my top five of what Tubi has to offer in no particular order. With Tubi, as you can see here, it looks like a lot of what I call Hallmark-esque kind of movies. Now, I'm not the largest audience for these type movies, so if you like those uh, type movies, I wish you a joyful watch. I won't be covering any of those here unless I happen to accidentally watch it and it was outstanding. I understand Hallmark movies are like a warm blanket, and you know exactly what you're getting into, and it's got uh, a lot of people watch them, and they're very popular, but uh, sorry, not going to cover them. Basically, the plot in these type movies is a woman has an asshole, asshole boyfriend, woman visits small town, woman meets stranger, woman dislikes stranger until falling in love with stranger, asshole boyfriend is told to go screw, Woman and stranger do the nasty and celebrate Christmas together, and these are particularly how Hallmark movies usually go, if it's Christmas or not Christmas. Pretty much the same storyline, and usually like uh, the lady is like a wedding planner or a chef or something to that effect. I don't know. They're all the freaking same. I just pretty much explained uh, every Hallmark movie ever. Sorry if you like them, they're formulaic and lazy and terrible filmmaking, and I realize they're designed that way. Hallmark movies are a manufactured product on an assembly line, kind of like Santa's workshop. Are there some good ones? I suppose. So not being a Grinch here, just stating the facts. Let's see what I have wrapped for you with a bow over on Tubi. And the choices are pretty sugary good. You know what I'm saying? No holiday season is complete without some rendition of this classic Dickens story, a Christmas Carol is a story by Charles Dickens, first published in London by Chapman and Hall in 1843 and illustrated by John Leach. A Christmas Carol recounts the story of Ebenezer Scrooge, an elderly miser who is visited by the ghost of his former business partner, Jacob Marley, and the spirits of Christmas past, present, and yet to come. After their visit, Scrooge is transformed into a kinder, gentler man. Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol during a period when the British were exploring and reevaluating past Christmas traditions, including carols and newer customs such as Christmas cards and Christmas trees. He was influenced by the experiences of his own youth and by the Christmas stories of other authors, including Washington Irving and Douglas Gerald. Gerald, I'm not sure how you say that. Dickens had written three Christmas stories before the novella and was inspired following a visit to the Field Lane Ragged school or ragged school, one of several establishments for London street children, the treatment of the poor and the ability of a selfish man to redeem himself by transforming into a more sympathetic character are the key themes of the story. There is discussion among academics as to whether this is fully secular story or if it is a Christian allegory. Published on December 19th, the first edition sold out by Christmas Eve, by the end of 1844, 13 editions have been released. Most critics reviewed the novella favorably. The story was illicitly copied in January of 1844. Dickens took legal action against the publishers who went bankrupt. Further reducing Dickens' small profits from the publication, he went on to write four other Christmas stories in subsequent years. In 1849, he began public readings of the story, which proved so successful, he undertook 127 further performances until 1870, the year of his death. 
A Christmas Carol has never been out of print and has been translated into several languages. The story has been adapted many times for film, stage, opera, and other media. A Christmas Carol captured the spirit of mid-Victorian revival of the Christmas holiday. Dickens acknowledged the influence of the modern Western observance of Christmas and later inspired several aspects of Christmas, including family gatherings, seasonal food and drink, dancing, games, and a festive generosity of spirit. This film version of story is a 1984 British-American made-for-television film adaption of Charles Dickens' famous 1843 novel of the same name. The film was directed by Clive Donner, who had been an editor of the 1951 film Scrooge, and stars George C. Scott as Ebenezer Scrooge. It was filmed in the historic medieval county town of Shrewsbury in Shropshire. Shropshire? It originally aired on the American television network CBS on December 17th of 1984 and was released theatrically in Great Britain. The U.S. debut was sponsored by IBM, which purchased all of the commercial spots for the two-hour premiere. The film brought in a 20.7 rating share, winning its time slot in ranking number 10 for the week. The film was marketed with the tagline, a new powerful presentation of the most loved ghost story of all time. Scott was nominated for an Emmy for Outstanding Lead Actor in a limited series or special for his portrayal of Scrooge. The movie is run in syndication on local American channels since its original airing in 1984 and was released on VHS in 1989 and on DVD in 1999. On November 25th of 2007, it returned to national television on AMC for the first time since its debut, and the network continues to broadcast each December under license from Scott Estate and 20th Century Studios, Walt Disney Studios Television. The latter's distribution rights, the result of their owning the video rights. In 2009, the Hallmark Channel also ran the movie soon after Thanksgiving. It remains among the most beloved of several adaptations of The Christmas Carol, In 2009, the film was re-released on DVD by Fox, which updated the box art, but the same menu and features as the previous DVD released, and Fox released it on Blu-ray in December of 2010. There are so many unique and good film versions of the Dickens classics. This particular one is one of my favorites that I've seen countless times since I was a kid. George C. Scott is brilliant, as always, uh, as Scrooge. Gals and guys, you can't go wrong with this holiday when watching this film. It will transport you right into the spirit of what this holiday is about. What every day should be about, really. But give this movie a go. You'll love it. It's great for the holiday. Also based on the same book is Scrooge with the late, great Elbert Finney. I love this one just as much as I love the George C. Scott version. So it would be a holiday injustice if I didn't spotlight it in this video. Scrooge is a 1970 British musical film adaptation of that Charles Dickens 1843 story, A Christmas Carol, that we just talked about. It was filmed in London between January and May of 1970 and directed by Ronald Neum, N-E-A-M-E, and starred Albert Finney as Ebenezer Scrooge. The film score was composed by Leslie Bracuse and arranged and conducted by Ian Fraser. With 11 musical arrangements interdispersed throughout the award-winning motion picture is a faithful musical retelling of the original. The film was a follow-up to another Dickens musical adaptation, the 1968 award-winning Oliver. The posters for Scrooge included the tagline, What the Dickens Have They Done to Scrooge? Designed to head off any criticism of an all-singing, all-dancing, old skinflint, Finney won the Golden Globe Award for Best Actor in a Musical Comedy in 1971. The film, it's musical slash comedy, this wasn't exactly a comedy. The film received four Academy Award nominations, including Best Original Song for Thank You Very Much. Thank you very much, that's the nicest thing that anyone's ever done for me. Those are two of my favorites uh, Christmas Car- of the Christmas Carol films, but you don't have to stop there. Tubi has over a dozen films, all based on Dickens' literature. Seek them out this holiday season. The Night They Saved Christmas. This is a fun film from my childhood. Uh, the effects are very dated. 
And I may be biased towards this film because it did remind me of being a kid again when I originally viewed it. Uh, the Night They Save Christmas is a 1984 American made-for-television fantasy drama film directed by Jackie Cooper and executive produced by Jack Haley Jr. and Robert Holmey Jr. The film about an oil company dynamiting in the North Pole in search of an oil field unaware that there is endangering Santa Claus stars Jacqueline Smith, a Charlie's Angel herself, and Art Kearney Norton and premiered on ABC on December 13th of 1984. The film was nominated for Outstanding Children's Program at the 37th Primetime Emmy Awards alongside Punky Brewster, an Ewok Adventure, and Reading Rainbow, with the award eventually going to an episode of American Playhouse. In his review for the New York Times, John J. O'Connor noted that even though the special effects encompassing Santa and his helpers are pleasant enough, the surrounding story doesn't generate much holiday cheer, which I'll have to disagree with John J. O'Connor. It's a great 80s Christmas movie. Take a look-see on that one. Mr. St. Nick is a 2002 Christmas comedy fantasy film starring Kelsey Grammer. It was produced by Hallmark, uh, Hallmark, Hallmark Entertainment and shown on ABC in the United States. It was the first broadcast as an episode of ABC's Wonderful World of Disney Anthology on November 17th of 2002. It was set mainly in Miami, Florida, United States, although it was filmed in Vancouver, British Columbia, and Canada. King Nicholas X, played by Charles Durning, has been Santa Claus for 100 years and is now preparing to hand over the baton to his and the Queen's son, Nick St. Nicholas, portrayed by Grammar. Nick St. Nicholas is living the high life in Miami and is slightly reluctant to become Santa Claus. Jasper, Nick's butler, hires a new cook, Lorena. He then gets enticed into betraying a fictitious Santa Claus for a charity event by characters Heidi and Hector. Nick begins to fall in love with Heidi and asks her to marry him. Little does he know that Hector and Heidi are transferring the charity's money into their account in the Cayman Islands. Why is it always the Cayman Islands? Anyways, soon, however, Nick starts to become closer to his loved ones, namely his father, and Nick starts to realize how special being with your loved ones is. As that happens, he also notices that he's getting to know Lorena better and is starting to develop feelings for her too which makes him rethink marrying Heidi. Nick eventually comes to see that he was wrong about everything and chooses Lorena instead. And if that's not a plot to an afternoon soap opera, I don't know what the hell is. You can't really go wrong with Kelsey Grammer leading the holiday charge. There's a fair share of dumb in this film and a lot of good here. The film is amusing enough to recommend this Christmas season. I had a good time with it. Grab your favorite blanket and snuggle up with some eggnog and give it a look-see. It's a Wonderful Life is a 1946 American Christmas family fantasy drama film produced and directed by Frank Capra, based on the short story and booklet The Greatest Gift, which Philip Van Deren Stern self-published in 1943, and is in turn loosely based on the 1843 Charles Dickens novella A Christmas Carol. The film stars James Stewart as George Bailey, a man who has given up his dreams to help others in his community and whose suicide attempt on Christmas Eve brings about the intervention of his guardian angel, Clarence Oddbody, played by Henry Travers. Clarence shows George how he, George, has touched the lives of others and how different life would be for his wife, Mary, and his community of Bedford Falls if he had not been born. Theatrically, the film's break-even point was $6.3 million, about twice the production cost, a figure it did not come close to achieving on its initial release. Because of the film's disappointing sales, Capra was seen by some studios as having lost his ability to produce popular, financially successful films. Although It's a Wonderful Life initially received mixed reviews and was unsuccessful at the box office, it became a classic Christmas film after it was put into the public domain, which allowed it to be broadcast without license or royalty fees. It's a Wonderful Life is considered one of the greatest films of all time. It was nominated for five Academy Awards, including Best Picture, and has been recognized by the American Film Institute as one of the 100 best American films ever made. 
It was number 11 on the American Film Institute's 1998 Greatest Movie List, number 20 on its 2007 Greatest Movie List, and number 1 on its list of the most inspirational American films of all time. Capra revealed that it was his favorite among the films he directed and that he screened it for his family every Christmas season. It was also Jeremy Stewart's favorite film. In 1990, the film was designated as culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant and added to the National Film Registry of the Library of Congress. All right, the following footage, I actually took this past weekend at Seneca Falls, and I'll explain what Seneca Falls is in just a moment. But to continue, the original story, The Greatest Gift, was written by Philip Van Doren Stern, which uh, I indicated, in November of 1939. After it was rejected by several publishers, he had it printed as a 24-page pamphlet and mailed it to 200 family members and friends for Christmas in 1943. The story came to the attention of either Cary Grant or RKO producer David Hemstead, who showed it to Grant's agent. In April of 1944, RKO Pictures bought the rights to the story for $10,000, hoping to turn it into a vehicle for Grant. Dalton Trumbo, Clifford Oditz, and Mark Connolly each worked on versions of the screenplay before Archeo shelved the project. In Trumbo's draft, George Bailey is an idealistic, idealistic sorry, politician who grows more cynical as the story progresses and tries to commit suicide after losing an election. The angel shows him Bedford Falls, not as it would be if he had never been born, but if he had gone into business instead of politics. Grant went on to make another Christmas movie staple, The Bishop's Wife, which we do cover here on uh, another video. Archeo studio chief Charles Corner urged Frank Capra to read The Greatest Gift. Capra's new production company, Liberty Films, had a nine-film distribution agreement with Archeo. Capra immediately saw its potential and wanted it for his first Hollywood film after making documentaries and training films during the war. Archeo sold Capra the rights for, well, $10,000 and threw in the three earlier scripts for free. Capra claims the rights and the scripts cost him $50,000. Who knows? Capra salvaged a few scenes from Odit's earlier screenplay and worked with writers Francis Goodrich and Albert Hackett, Jill Swirling, Michael Wilson, and Dorothy Parker. She was brought in to polish the script on many drafts of the screenplay. It was not a harmonious collaboration. Goodrich called Capra that horrid man <laughs> and recalled he, wouldn't, he couldn't wait to get writing it himself. Her husband, Albert Hackett, said we told him what we were going to do, and he said that sounds fine. We were trying to move the story along and work it out, and then somebody told us that Capra and Joe Swirling were working on it together, and that sort of took the guts out of it. Joe Sterling was a very close friend of ours, and when we heard he was doing this, we felt rather bad about it. We were getting near to the end, and word came that Capra wanted to know how soon we'd be finished, so my wife said we're finished right now. We quickly wrote out the last scene, and we never saw him again after that. He's a very arrogant son of a bitch. Well, so there you go. Later, a dispute ensued over the writing credits. Capra said the screenwriters arbitration committee decided that Hackett and Goodrich and I should get the credit for writing. Joe Swirling hasn't talked to me since. That was five years ago. The final screenplay renamed by Capra, It's a Wonderful Life, was credited to Goodrich, Hackett, and Capra with additional scenes by Joe Swirling. Seneca Falls, the, uh, the footage I've been showing you here. Uh, New York claims that Capra was inspired to model Bedford Falls after the town uh, visit in 1945. The town has an annual It's a Wonderful Life festival in December. In mid-2009, the Hotel Clarence opened in Seneca Falls, named after George Bailey's guardian angel. On December 10, 2010, the It's a Wonderful Life Museum opened in Seneca Falls with Carolyn Grimes, who played Zuzu in the movie Cutting the Ribbon. However, film historian Janine Basinger, curator of the Frank Capra Archives of Westland University and author of It's a Wonderful Life book, has said no evidence exists for Seneca Falls' claim. She says, I have been through every piece of paper in Frank Capra's diaries, his archives, everything. There's no evidence of any sort of whatsoever to support this. That doesn't mean it isn't true, but no one is ever going to prove it. Basinger said that Capra always described Bedford Falls as every town. 
a classic and a very highly recommended watch this film is. If you've never seen it or even heard of it, then uh, climb out of whatever cave you've been living in and watch this film immediately. All right, gals and guys, and those are my five recommendations for Tubi. I also want you to be aware of something else on Tubi real quick. Um, so if you go to Tubi.com, Tubi tv.com and you put in like uh i think it's like christmas log um you can just bring up and you can do this on youtube too i'll this isn't a youtube video so i'll spotlight that there here or there too but this is just something cool you can have on your computer in the background i don't have a fireplace so this would be awesome and um it has it has music and everything to it um you can also do this as well um, if you do Christmas lights, so you can go into like this and just have Christmas lights in the background on your computer, just kind of like a behind the scene ambiance to, you know, the background, the background, lovish. And then you can do like, um, fireplace, I think was the other keyword that I was thinking of. Same deal. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. There's Christmas specials too on here, which are cool. I'm not doing a Christmas special video. I'm doing a Christmas movie video. But um, yeah, especially the Honeymooners. That would be awesome to watch. I haven't seen that. But anyways, guys and gals, I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas. This is the first video of seven. Hopefully I can get them done before Christmas. And you like my hat? I got a special Christmas hat from a young lady who gave that to me. Um, <laughs> it has nothing to do with anything. Have a Merry Christmas, gals and guys, and I will see you the next video. I think the next video is IMDBTV. So see you then. Bye.